This is the Pitch Vision Academy Cricket Show Series 7, Episode 10. It wasn't as good as I thought. Coming up on this week's Pitch Vision Academy Cricket Show, Labour sees an incredible catch. Or does he? Find out in the show. We also talk about teaching techniques, helping a batsman who's good in nets but struggling in the middle, and have a look at a spin bowler's action to see if we can help him improve. All that and more coming up on this week's Pitch Vision Academy Cricket Show. Welcome to the Pitch Vision Academy Cricket Show, your guide to cricket coaching or cricket playing, wherever you are and whoever you are. We're here to give you a hand for the next half an hour or so. My name is David Hinchliffe and uh, I look after things here and helping me to help you are two very fine cricket coaches. The first is the Director of Cricket Coaching at Millfield School. It's Mark Garraway. Hello, Garris. How are you? I'm very well. I'm watching some tennis to my my uh, left-hand Oof. side and I'm watching some cricket nets to my right-hand side. And it's March. I love it. Well, how about that? It's, it's earliest summer on record, obviously. It is. It, well, I wouldn't go as far as summer, but it's dry. <laughs> That's summer. I'm calling that summer. <laughs> You're in Scotland. That is dry. That is the summer for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, get outside quick. Uh, secondly, it's the cricket professional at Portsmouth Grammar School. It's Sam Lavery. Hello, Lavers. Hello, David. How's things up there? Very good, thanks. Yeah, tentatively getting outside and um, uh, making the transition from outdoors to indoors is always a, always a fun thing. Uh, someone had a bowl... Uh, yesterday on the square and he said it feels like I'm bowling in glue because <laughs> I've gone from such a, a, a hard concrete surface to this not quite ready for uh, for, for cricket field <laughs> and uh, the, it, the key it felt question very is, weird. Has anyone has the groundsman shouted at anyone yet? No fortunately not no we've um, we, we've managed to sneak past him every time so far we've we've turned up with the doors locked a few times but we've just gone in through a hole in the fence so there's no stuff in us <laughs> Now, I wanted to talk about uh, a little bit this week about something that I saw uh, in a recent ECB CA uh, manual, the yearbook that came out. And I saw that it got some criticism, a little bit of criticism on Twitter. And it was about uh, using sort of academic models of, of coaching people compared to, I suppose, the trial and error mo- model of going into the nets and trying things with people and seeing what works for you with them and and sort of being a bit more, well, you know, in the trenches, if you like. The the ECB uh, booklet had had a couple of different sort of models that were picked from from scientific research. One was called 5A and one was called Right Way, Wrong Way. And um, they they were both criticised basically on Twitter as sort of scientific mumbo jumbo. And um, the, the implication was that you know, the real way to get people to learn is, is don't worry about all the theory, just get into the nets and get practicing. So I, I thought that'd be a great point to discuss. How much do you rely on kind of these, uh, these models, these, these theories, and how much do you rely on something a bit more instinctive and a bit more sort of, uh, you know, we'll just see, we'll try things and see what happens. Well, I don't think I don't think it should be either, really, um, in terms of uh, relying on a theory. I, I think probably if I was to go one way, it would be more trial and error. But I would think that would also not be reflective of my coaching, really, because over the years I've been exposed to a lot of these um, uh, concepts, a lot of these uh, research papers, and, and what I find every time I read a research paper is whilst you can pick holes in it and you can be critical as obviously has happened on the internet here Uh, it also brings up a two or three things that you naturally do within your coaching anyway um, because it's based on real coaching around the world or in in fact it's something that comes up which says actually if I added that to my coaching practice it might be useful so I think anything that you read you read with how can I use this is it relevant how can I use it and which bit that can I use and and that should be the same whether you're reading a, a document about how Brendan McCullum plays 2020 cricket or how Chris Gale goes about it as much as it is about how you should go about your coaching. You read it and go, which bit of that is relevant? Which bit can I work with? What does it mean to me? Uh, and that's the way whenever I read anything or hear anything, I take it on board. And, and it's stood me in relatively uh, good stead, I think. 
Labors, how much do you uh, look into the, sort of the academic, the, the theory side of things, and how much do you do you find yourself using? I think it's always quite interesting to read what people are um, are uh, have written or what the, the work that's going on, and it maybe is re- reaffirming things that are already out there and, and, and ideas or theories that are already being used, and it may be just trying to justify them a little bit further, or maybe it's breaking new ground and and um, it's something that's going to be uh, a new string to your bow. But I think exposing yourself to different ideas and, and reading different people's opinions and um, then putting yourself in a position where you can um, – effectively judge whether or not or how much or how little you want to use them is, is a pretty good place to put yourself in rather than um, closing the door on things and saying that they don't work or these these things aren't for me um, just just opening your eyes and, and having a little bit of awareness of there are different models out there there are different things and people are constantly coming up with new new uh, new plans new techniques new initiatives that could be useful there uh, um, it, I, I, I can't see any reason why you, you wouldn't want to. Um, as Gareth said, it's then applying it to yourself and your own experience as a coach and, and, and the groups or the individuals you're working with to, to apply the information that's then, then relevant. I suppose what you don't want to do is, is to quickly turn around, get, have a new idea, think to yourself, well, that doesn't fit my, my way of thinking, so it must be wrong. So I'm just going to poo-poo it immediately because it's not it, it's not something which is of interest to me. I guess if you get into if you get into that mindset, you're closing yourself off to something that potentially could be good. It might you might be right, but you don't know unless you are open to it. I, I think that's spot on, mate. And and one of the things that we do, we have a Monday afternoon meeting in my department, and somebody has to bring something to the table, and then we discuss it. So the other week, for example, there's a, a guy called Bondacek. It's a, a way way do you train? Way you go about training sessions, and how to structure them, and how to program them, and what have you. And I got Dan Hellis, one of our coaches, to read this book, which is absolutely massive, and then pick out <laughs> some key principles that he uh, read in there that he thought were worthy of discussion around how you should finish sessions how you should build a session up what you should do at each phase and we basically went through it and said okay how does this relate to cricket how does this relate to what we do and I reckon we out of the 14 principles which Dan uh, narrowed it down to we've taken on six and incorporated that into our practice on a more consistent basis than we were before. Um, we haven't dismissed the whole thing. We dismissed some of the things as maybe not being relevant to cricket or the way that we work here at Millfield. But the other things have just sort of heightened our awareness a little bit. And it certainly um, makes us question our own practice and maybe even review slightly differently. And uh, so, you know, what we got six out of 14 things there. Um, you know, if I can get six points or even one point out of a document yeah. that helps me to get better, then that's got to be useful. But to take something on verbatim or to dismiss something on verbatim, I think is probably uh, a bit short-sighted. OK, Gary, so you've got to give us one of those six now. You can't dangle that carrot without giving us one of them. OK, so one of the ones that we, we've done is that a lot of the time we do skill development within a session. So you might be, for example, working on some short ball stuff or playing off a back foot against spin. And you can do that with a number of drills, whether it be tennis ball or bowling machine or whatever the case may be. But you should always finish the session having... Uh, applied that into a realistic situation so getting bowlers to bowl at you or or, uh, simulating exactly what you're going to get out in the middle and then if you do that training session enough you should see an increase in effectiveness over the course of those little scenarios or um, or those putting a bowler against a batter uh, as the sessions go on and on and on so a real basic thing that most people are probably doing but I, I also think back to some of my sessions where Maybe we've just kept doing the drills or whatever and then practicing it in four weeks and expecting a change. You should be testing that every single time, maybe in the last five minutes of each session. The other thing is, can you do the other gem that we've got is, you know, if you're working with two players and obviously if you've got a bowling machine going or you're throwing at somebody, then... um, uh, the other person is static and passive at that, at that point in time. You know, can you incorporate another element that they can go off to and practice self-reliantly at the same time? So if you've got three minutes with somebody, then they can be using that three minutes wisely rather than just waiting their turn. There you go. So th- there's two Adam. bits of stuff that come out of Bondachet that have, have made an impact on us because sometimes we did it and sometimes we don't. We now do it all the time. I got one. It, it actually came from long before I knew I knew about it, but um, I learned about this uh, idea called peak end rule, 
where you, you remember things that happen at the end of, a, say, a, a coaching session yep. more than you do at, at the beginning or in the middle. So I, uh, long ago, I was told, always finish on a good one. So um, and then I learned about peak end rules. So now I've kind of made it a rule that uh, it, it, unless, unless someone's completely going wrong, always finish on a good one. Mm. So if it's, a, if it's a straight drive, make sure you get it out the middle. OK, we're done. Let's go home. <laughs> That's, yep. that that's works really well because it's just it it make it does make you feel okay that was good even if it wasn't as good as you hoped it would be if you finish on a good one that works really well have you got any of those labors uh no off the top of my head <laughs> i just <was enjoy, laughs> enjoy listening to them labors is labors is one is if you haven't got anything to say that's going to add value then don't say anything at all and i think absolutely. that's an absolutely spot one spot on one that's as good a bit of advice as you uh as you could ever hear <laughs> well, another piece of advice I'm going to give now, uh, especially Labors, is um, do say something in this next section because uh, we definitely want a one word answer from you because it's the yes, no round. Three questions that can only be answered yes or no, no matter how much more the team want to say. I've got them, so let's fire away. First question Tactics are rarely wrong in the planning and often wrong in the execution. Yes. Yes. Second question. Chase outcomes, not techniques. Yes. Yes. Third question. All failure is feedback. All success is confidence. Yes. No. Time now for us to get some feedback from the listeners to this show or perhaps readers to the Pitch Vision website. It's the questions section where... We have a couple of questions sent in. We do our best to answer them, and then we pick a winner. The best question of the week wins a prize that is an online coaching course, courtesy of Pitch Vision Academy at pitchvision.com. And Wesley sent in a question, hopefully to win the prize, but certainly get it answered. So let's have a go at that now. He says, hi, I've recently been struggling with my batting out in the middle. In the nets, I see and play balls so well. But due to a lack of runs in games, I seem to lose confidence and can't see the ball like normal. I'm usually an attacking batsman and score fast, but I seem to freeze when batting in matches. Please help me. So that's it. interesting that he would say um, I'm not seeing the ball as well in the middle as I am in nets. Um, yeah, I think it is interesting, actually, because he seems to have identified the, the kind of visual aspects of it, hasn't he? And he d- doesn't see the ball as well. Um, I mean, this is something that you sometimes do get with with batsmen, where um, going from nets to going to an open field, or or going to uh, from wearing a helmet or a hat to to not wearing one, just changes your focus and your kind of visual aspect of it. So whether or not that's actually what he's focusing on, not I'm not sure, and it may just be the way he's written it, and we're picking up on. Um, the wrong part of the of the sentence, or the the emphasis is in the wrong part of the of the question, but that is that is something that can happen. So trying to just take his uh, his kind of his uh, focus in and just reduce that vision, which is something we talked about a little bit before of looking at a big picture and looking at a big area, or trying to zone in and different people kind of excel doing things in different ways. It may be that there are distractions out there and maybe he's not gaining his focus visually as well as as well as he might do in a net situation because of the environment around him um obviously with with fielders around maybe he's trying to make too many decisions at the same time and he's trying too hard to focus on where he's hitting the ball as opposed to focusing on hitting the ball in the first place so it might be a visual um a visual thing is i mean is that your initial interpretation of the question because i think probably is for me is in in, in the way i've read it mm. Yeah, I think so. I think because he's he's specifically pointed out seeing the ball. I think that's you know that's his language, isn't it? He's saying to, he's saying he's he feels like there's something different between actually picking up the line and length of the ball, and that's causing him to not feel in a position to play aggressively. Well, well given that, then I think this it's trying to merge the two. Um, experiences together and obviously one seems fairly successful in, a, in an environment where he's quite confident and where he feels relaxed and he's doing very well um, so the more he can make that environment a little bit more match specific um, the closer he's going to get towards developing confidence and applying himself successfully in, in a game scenario um, and there are a number of ways he can do that um, 
whether, whether it be trying to have fields in play or trying to make decisions during a net or um, we actually talked about one in a, in a, a, a drill that we put out this week, didn't we, David, with um, mm-hmm. some zoning to try and make people make decisions about where they're going to score runs. Um, and it could be simply that the, the decisions he's having to make based on where the field field is, is kind of clouding his judgment and he's taking his focus away from the ball and, and maybe just investing a little bit more time in looking at the ball and not being too concerned initially about the field and his matches or trying to elevate the... Uh, the uh, input of, of the field and the decision making into his nets and hopefully the two will meet somewhere in the middle and, and, and maybe that t- performance in the nets can translate onto the field but um, I would I would suggest try to try to retain focus on the ball and try and think um, about focusing on that when you get into your match situation but definitely in nets try and have a heightened awareness of a match situation and, and try and make that, uh, that environment simulate um, oh my god sorry I've got to stop there I've just seen a ridiculous catch on TV <laughs> Did anyone else see that? <laughs> Who is it? Um, right, Pandya has just pulled it. Sorry, and if anyone's listening, I'm not sure if this gets edited in or out. Um, <laughs> he's just pulled it out to mid-wicket boundary, and one of the Bangladeshi boys has sprinted round, dived full length, probably two metres inside, and picked it off the floor, I'm guessing half a foot off the floor, full length, left-handed. Quality, loving it. It was great. Anyway. We'll look at that later. I mean, I'm now I'm now worrying that he looks remarkably calm and cool about the fact he's just plucked a. Yeah, it was it was was wasn't as good as I thought. wasn't as good as I thought. <laughs> uh, oh. two, two hands dived afterwards. One for the cameras. Needs editing don't, that, Dave. I'm afraid. Yeah, get get rid of that. <laughs> don't worry, ladies. None of this will ever go out. <laughs> Fantastic. Same as always. Well, Garris, <laughs> back to the question. Well, well, I think to add to what Sam's talked about, it sounds to me as there's a very much of a different perceived threat, really, between uh, the open situation where you're very, you know, you're being judged, aren't you? When you're out, you're out in the game of cricket, whereas opposed in a net situation, we're not. And uh, and I think you can do two things, really. You can work, just as Sam said, work on the nets of being more specific and ultimately have those nets every now and again. It doesn't have to be that everybody does it when they're out, they're out. But you might want to say to the bowlers as you walk into bat, OK, if you get me out nicked off, if you get me LBW or bowled, I go. Or if I lob one up in the air, I go. Um, so if you get me out first ball, that's the end of my practice. And then all of a sudden that heightens the pressure and the expectation um, around that around that practice. And that's a really valuable thing to do. And as I say, it's not always the coach that needs to set that up because I've seen top quality players walk into a net and say to the bowlers, when you get me like this, that's the end of it. And then they've batted. I mean, Cookie's done it a couple of times in nets that I've been... Uh, privileged enough to watch where he's walked in and said to the net bowlers not necessarily the England bowlers but to the guys that are um, a service in the nets that this is what he's going to do and on one occasion he's batted for you know 45 minutes 50 minutes without uh, getting out and on another occasion he, he lasted 15 minutes and then nicked off and then and then walked off but he put himself under the same pressure in terms of batting out in the middle as to batting in a, in a net and what he didn't do was go shotless he went uh, and just did exactly what he does when he plays out in the middle and I think that's crucial so you can set up all of his zones and stuff which is really really valuable but the bottom line is what I'm reading this is, is there's a perceived different uh, threat playing in matches than there is there is in um, a net situation and the other thing that I'll say and I've said it l- countless times on this show is that dismissal is a part of cricket and if you are a top order batter and you walk into bat and it goes back to a conversation I had with Kevin Peterson back in 2007 where I said to him you know why why do you uh, why do you go so well why do you uh, you know just enjoy what you're doing so, so much and he said because there's no point in fear in getting out because as a top order batter I walk into the middle and there's a there's 94% chance that I'm going to walk back again after being dismissed so why should I be worried about that and then I look at the top performers in the world now and I and the top performers I consider to be somebody like a Steve Smith somebody like an A.B. De Villiers somebody like a Joe Root and they love everything that they're doing out in the middle and even when they get out whilst they're disappointed just like we're all disappointed when we've got out they also don't look as if it's the complete end of their world they almost smile sometimes when they when they get out 
Okay, they learn from the experience, but they're not fearful of that dismissal because it's all about what you do before you get dismissed, not about the dismissal itself. And it sounds to me that you've got a different uh, mindset and a different fear of failure when you go into a net as to when you go out to the middle. Ultimately, what's the worst thing that can happen when you go out the back? You can get out. Jeffrey Boycott would kill me for saying that. But hey, <laughs> that is life because most of the time that does happen. It's about what you do before you get that fateful ball that goes into somebody's hands or an umpire finger going up that matters yeah yeah precisely and I was going to say exactly that as well because um, KP said that in the um, pitch vision course that you did as well it's exactly yeah, the same that's right thing. yeah he, uh, and uh, you know it, and it's not it's not sometimes when you hear players say things you always you, you often think well do you actually believe that or is that something that you just say but I absolutely believed you know the way that he said it you know the relaxed manner that he said it it was so, it was just it was just, just to him it was just a fact it wasn't it wasn't something that he said to himself to g himself up it was just it was just a fact of the matter well i'm going to get out anyway so i might as well enjoy it while i'm there and um you know that's that's a message that i often give to players as well as you know it, it, enjoy it because you know whether you're out there for two balls or whether you're out there for 200 balls you know you got you've got to enjoy it <laughs> otherwise what's the point <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a huge believer and, and the most dangerous time that Paul Collingwood who wasn't noted for being the most aesthetically pleasing batter in the world apologies for that Collie but you weren't um, <laughs> you know he, he said during his most successful period in international cricket where he could literally not do anything wrong he just got to a stage of his career where he just sort of sod it you know I'm just going to go out there and have, have, have a bit of fun and uh, I'm going to see what I can do before I get out because I'm going to get out more often than not. And he stopped fearing that failure, which is associated with dismissal. And it made the world of difference too. I think that's, that's something that 2020 has been brilliant at is that it's probably freed a few people up. And there are some people whose method and kind of um, impact and maybe their whole careers changed because they've been told it doesn't, it, it almost doesn't matter. Um, Obviously, it matters to a degree if you get out, but they've been told that the expectation is that you take take more risks, go for it, see what happens, and suddenly people are realising there's this whole new world of batting that, or this whole different side to them that they maybe they didn't show or maybe they didn't even understand that they had, and and um, it's what one of the great benefits that 2020 cricket's bringing to the game. Next question is from Nick, and Nick says. I would like for you guys to take a look at my action and identify some things I need to improve on. My coaches say that my aiming arm is not really active and I need to be higher. They also say that my follow through is more like a fast bowler and not a spinner. I also bowl too full as a spinner. Can you help me? So he's provided a link to, uh, to a video. Um, so what do we think? Yeah, look, thanks for the video and Firstly, uh, you've got some good things going on there, Nick. Um, you know, so I don't think it's going to take a lot to get you uh, to perform an even better level than you are already. What we don't get to see is the outcome. Um, and, and certainly we haven't got a, a sense of that, and you'll be a far better judge of that. But it sounds that you've identified or your coach has identified that you uh, are bowling slightly too full. I suppose one of the things that, you know, if we go really back to basics, that often makes spinners bowl fuller, I'm not saying too full, but bowl fuller is when they've got uh, a run-up pace which um, can be a little bit too fast at times. Uh, and uh, certainly in some experiments that I've done with uh, spin bowlers who generally under-pitch rather than over-pitch, um, I've encouraged them to increase their uh, approach pace to, to the pitch in order to get the ball to go naturally fuller without them having to force the ball. Uh, and that's had an effect. So if you turn that on its head and you are bowling too full, then you might want to uh, experiment with just having a slightly slower um, approach to the wicket and see what effect that has. So that, that would be really back to basics, but always a, a good place to, to start. In terms of your front arm, I can sort of see what they're saying, but again, 
uh, it's not a deal breaker for me, um, that, depending on the outcome. Uh, and yes, you could experiment again with having a, a higher front arm. So I can I can see where they're coming from on that. But there are other strong bits about your action that um, that I think are, are great, and you might want to have a little look at that. But uh, again, it wouldn't be a deal breaker as long as you're landing the ball in the right sp- place and and getting that ball to spin, which is the most important thing for 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 any spinner. In terms of your follow through, I think your follow through is a bit of a consequence of your run up pace and the energy that you're producing in your run up pace. So if you think about a fast bowler runs in faster than a spinner, so therefore has to follow through further. I think maybe if you adjust your run up pace, then you might be able to reduce that follow through a little bit. But ultimately, um, a follow through is only only there as a spinner to absorb all of the forces that you created at the crease and then prepare you for the opportunity of the ball coming back your way because as soon as you've let go of the ball and you've finished your your arm circle, you're then becoming a fielder and a very valuable fielder. And I just wonder whether you lose impact as a fielder as a result of not being able to be ready off your own bowling. You've got to be able to catch off your own bowling champion, and I'm sure you sure you know that. So again, you might want to experiment with uh, having a more uh, conventional follow through finish position um, and uh, that might be useful but but I do see a lot of spin bowlers when they bowl to a camera or when they're just doing their action follow through just like you because they forget that in a natural game context or in a net context the ball could come back at them at the rate of knots so to me it's run up pace have a tinker with that yeah I can see what they're saying around front arm and again have an experiment see how that feels to yourself but ultimately if you're landing the ball in the right place and if uh, you're getting it to spin and you can make sure that you're a good fielder of your own bowling by being ready for that ball coming back. You're not going to go too far wrong. Yeah, you do see that a bit more, don't you, Lavers? The front arm sort of um, dying away as the front foot lands. You see, you tend to see that a bit more in spinners than you do in faster bowlers. I guess because the faster bowlers want to get every every uh, little bit of pace out and uh, getting that arm in a in a stronger position. Yeah, that front foot contact is more important. Yeah, fast bowlers obviously fo- focused on speed development, I guess, and trying to bowl as fast as they can. So they're looking to try and make sure anything that is moving is is generally working as hard as it possibly can be. And and maybe spinners aren't necessarily in the same mindset. Um, I know that if um, if Terry Jenner was to have a look at it, the first thing he'd do is he'd turn turn your hand around. Um, because he'd uh, it often say you can't can't really push you can't push with the back of your hand you push with the front of your hand so he'd probably want you to turn your hand around for me I don't think it's um, massively important although again something worth maybe trying but I wouldn't say that's uh, that's uh, something that's going to be necessarily revolutionise your your uh, front arm or, or your action. Um, uh, I think the key thing that I've got to pick up on in the question really is that when you talk about your bowling, you've talked about your outcomes. So you say you bowl full and you've talked about how the, the ball lands. And when you've talked about what your coach says, your coach has talked about the processes that are doing it. So maybe the, the chat that you need to have is, is with your coach and try and find somewhere you can meet in the middle and his conversation about outcomes and you uh, sorry about processes of front arms and, and, and how are you following through and your feelings about how we, how you bowl uh, can maybe could be combined. So you have a shared target of what you're actually trying to achieve because is it that you want to spin the ball more? Is it you want to bowl um, with more control or you want to get more dip or bounce or whatever it could be? Um, and once you've got that in your head, you can start thinking about what are the process that are going to help me try and achieve that. So first I'll be thinking, yes, I want to be better, but let's, pinpoint where I want to be better and once you've got an agreed goal of how you want to improve start start talking about what the process is that could have an impact because based on what we're seeing the action action looks pretty good I completely agree with Garras I can see why your coach is saying that um, it's not a powerful movement with that front arm with the aiming arm as you've called it but um, the action's pr- re- reasonably tidy so it'd be, it'd be good to see a little bit of a follow-up video at some stage from a different angle where we can see the actual delivery and maybe see three or four deliveries in a row and how they're reacting and, and also get that that kind of opinion from you on what it is you specifically want to improve on. Um, you've mentioned length. You bowl a little bit full as a spinner. Um, I guess... I'd like, in, to know, I'd like to know how he knows that as well because yeah. often that's, you know, it's an impression you get. It's that peak end rule thing again, isn't it? It's the impression you get. But when you actually measure it, it's, it's not quite the same. So I'd be interested to see how that's, how that's measured. 
does he get driven a lot, or what? You know, what's what's the what's the indicator of whether he's bowling too full? I mean, it's yeah, easy to I, say, isn't it? It, it may be. I mean, we, I've I've got a spinner who works with the school, and his his opinion was actually that he bowled a bit too full. Um, and actually, what it came down to was he didn't turn the ball enough. Um, yep, there you go. Because he, he's bowling pretty good length, but if you don't turn it, people can just hit straight back through you, and they can treat a ball that's kind of almost length as as one that's actually almost a half volley. Um, so yeah, yeah it would be interesting to see where your kind of um, judgment or how your judgment has been made. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to see some videos of the actual outcome, and, and if you can get those in by Dropbox, either in a either in um one of the podcasts or, or just separately we'll um we'll have a look at them and uh, it'd be good to, to see how the actual ball comes out and what what kind of reaction you're getting off the surface time now for the soapbox that is 60 seconds on the clock one of the members of the team gets to talk uninterrupted for a minute this week it's mark garraway over to you garras I've had some really interesting discussions. It's that stage of the year now where you're doing your review of the the winter period. And uh, we get our county coaches on the phone, on Skype, or they come down and have a chat with us. And it's been really interesting to uh, see how they go about talking to me and my other coaches about players that they've worked on, if they've got something that they would like them to work on that they Mm. don't think that we've covered. And um, it's the way that their body language shifts. Uh, but, you know, they, they, they sort of like sit back in their chair and they avert, uh, avert um, eye contact and, you know, start talking in 150 words about something that should take about 10, 10 seconds to go through. And you know that they're feeling uncomfortable about bringing something up that they perceive as being uh, something that I might take defensively or my coaches might take defensively. But the bottom line is that we never will. Um, and every time they give us a, an option or an idea, then it's to help that person out. So when you are talking as a coach or as a player about other players, then don't be afraid to come out with stuff because uh, people will generally know if you're well-intentioned and you're trying to help uh, and uh, they won't perceive it as being an attack. So uh, that's the important thing. And that is just about all we've got time for on the show this week. Before we go, we do need to decide one more thing, which is the winner of this week's online coaching course from Pitch Vision Academy at pitchvision.com. So we had Wesley's question about struggling batting in the middle when he's doing well in nets. And we had Nick's question about improving his bowling technique. Which one did you prefer this week, Garris? Well, I'm going to go with Wesley's this week because uh, I wasn't a good net player, but then again, I wasn't any good in the middle either. So um, <laughs> hopefully the advice that we've given is, uh, is good enough for you, Wesley, and many others out there. It has certainly benefited me, I think, and uh, uh, I know working with a lot of young players that it would benefit them too. Fabulous. Congratulations to you, Wesley. And um, Gareth, if someone was listening to the show and they wanted to send in their own question... Uh, get it answered and possibly win that prize for themselves how could they get in touch with us they could give us a call on 0203 239 7543 and as the tractor drives off it's uh, they could give us an email on <laughs> coach at pitchvision.com and that is right social media is around as well our facebook is facebook.com slash pitchvisionacademy and our twitter is at pitchvisionacad You can listen to this show every week. It's free and it comes out on Fridays. You can download it onto your phone or whatever device you've got by going to your podcast app and doing a search for Pitch Vision Academy. You'll find us in there pretty easily. And if you want to stream the show on the web or you want to get the show notes or get old shows, you can do all that by going to pitchvision.com slash academy, clicking on the podcast link to get all the details there. That's all for this week. We hope you listen next week. But until then, have a good week. Cheers, Garris. Cheers, Lavis. Cheers, fellas. Cheers, fellas.